as a French professor, read my paper. I want to talk about blackboards, philosophical blackboards. I will try to convince you that uh, we are now taking, thinking near the horizon of a metaphysical black holes, but also that it's possible to escape its fatal attraction. When we take a look at the contemporary metaphysical realm, what do we observe? Philosophers engaged in conceptual analysis, trying to clarify the meaning of words such as substance, causation, identity, property, etc. Philosophers engage in what is now called ontology, attempting to determine the general categories of being, particulars, universals, relations, tropes, parts, wool, etc. Philosophers working as historians or anthropologists to understand, to understand metaphysics of the past or of other cultures. Philosophers focused on subjectivity and developing a transcendental wealth on shown or of phenomenology of the Constitution. Philosophers meditating on the withdrawal of being, and so on. So we observe an intense activity, an extensive work. But to tell the truth, despite their philosophical qualities, most of these achievements, not all, most of these achievements are somewhat disappointing. Or to say, as if philosophers could not allow themselves to think freely as if they were forbidden to speculate. Indeed, on closer inspection, we find that they are content to describe. To put it another way, one feels in the metaphysical realm a certain tension, a tension between what could be taught and what is actually taught. This tension becomes quite obvious when we look, as a philosopher, at how we try to solve some problem. I, cho I choose one, this one. The so-called problem, problem of non-locality. A few years ago, we thought that each event in space-time, each event A occurring in some location X at time T, was caused by some other event in its past life. In other words, we thought that for predicting the occurrence of an event A, in principle, it was sufficient to know all the events laying in some section of its life, past life code. It seemed that it has to be so because of the theory of relativity. Each event is caused. Possibly probabilistically by a perturbation propagating through space with a velocity at most equal to the speed of light. As we said, nature is local. But no, we know that now that we are wrong, we were wrong. There are events whose occurrence cannot be explained this way, in this way. Physicists are able to produce pairs of events A and B, each being located outside of the light cone of the other, 
which are correlated in such a way that even we knew all the events of their past cycles, we could not predict their occurrence. It's a fact. All the experimental loopholes are closed now. There are correlations at a distance, as predicted by quantum theory. So, as it is frequently said, nature is non-local. An event such as A is caused by events laying outside of its past life. Therefore, we are in trouble, to say the least. Nature is local and non-local. Of course, as physicists, we can live with this discomfort. <coughs> we know that the quantum theory doesn't contradict the theory of relativity, and that these two empirically adequate, adequate theories are in peaceful coexistence. But as philosophers, we are lost in contradiction. How can it be? How can it be that the occurrence of this event A can be explained by the occurrences of events inside its past life? More than that, since the theory of relativity has much has never been contradicted, how can it be that the occurrence of this event A can be explained by the occurrence of any event. If I were God and knew all the events of a section of space-time, I could not predict the occurrence of this event. How can it be? There must be some reason. Not because we want to believe that there is one, but because we have at our disposal a theory that predicts the occurrence of this event, the quantum theory. Moreover, as predicted by this same theory, the occurrence of this event is strongly correlated with the occurrence of event B. Therefore, it does not occur by mere chance so, we can be skeptical, there is a reason, and we have to be able to discover it. Since, again, we have at our disposal a theory that predicts correctly what happens at location X at instant T. What is the kind of event you're so worried about? Pardon? What is the kind of event you're so worried about, or the kind of phenomenon? Uh, the, the result of a measurement, oh. in the lab. What's wrong no about that? I talk about correlation at distance, and... How are these correlations set up? We will talk about, about this after, OK? <laughs> <laughs> but what kind of reason could be given? How could we explain a phenomenon like the occurrence of A? No other phenomenon of which can be the cause. At this point, we experience a tension. We wish to explain the phenomena by the phenomena only. And we know that it's impossible, but we don't dare to draw the conclusion. This tension is clearly of a metaphysical nature. If, if we take a closer look, it's reminiscent of the restraint that we observed in the contemporary metaphysical realm. As philosophers, we have to say what it is and what can be, but not what must be, or metaphysics can only be descriptive. But what should it be so? 
By asking this question, one can only observe that the only answer we can give is the following one, because we think that it must be so. Or more exactly, because we are inclined to think that it must be so. But why are we inclined to think that it must be so? It's by asking this new question that we discovered the metaphysical black, the metaphysical black hole I wanted to talk about. This black hole this black hole is phenomenalism, and its horizon is the Kantian philosophy. The closer we get to, the, to it, the more difficult it is for us to think that there are other beings than ideas and phenomena. Beyond the horizon, it's impossible to think by ourselves. What exists is the transcendental subject with its senses, its sensitivity and its understanding, and everything that can be known are phenomena. Even at a distance, its effects are devast devastating. As we have just seen, we come to believe that all phenomena can only be explained by phenomena. We know how this phenomenalistic black hole Black hole was formed. There was first a little philosophical star, as there are many more, atomism, built by Democritus and Epicurus. It was rediscovered several centuries later and much more, more brilliant by natural philosophers as Gassendi and Boyle. Some years later, oh, some years later, Locke gave it a philosophical density which was sufficient to make it attractive to a great majority of philosophers. In the meantime, Newton endowed it with a huge mass by building on it modern physics, thanks to the combination of mathematics and the experimental method. Within a few decades, because of the prodigious empirical adequacy of Newtonian physics, corporealism collapsed by the effect of the success it made possible. So, so all the characteristics of this system, its hypothesis and its principles became invisible and then only phenomena remains. More attractive as ever, as remarked by Kant, who explained why it should be so. Fortunately, there are facts, empirical facts, which are more solid than any philosophical thesis. And as we have seen, one of these facts proves that the phenomenalistic <coughs> thesis is wrong and that we have to transgress the Kantian limits of pure reason in search of beings laying beyond the phenomena. But how could this be done? How could we hope to determine rationally the nature of what is not phenomenal but explains why the phenomena are as they are. Indeed, on the one hand, postulating that these things in themselves are ideas, we would agree to disappear in this black hole. On the other hand, the empirical science are science of phenomena, so, the, so that we cannot rely on them to achieve such an objective. As you can imagine, I don't have the solution. But it seems possible to find one. Because, as the physical ones, physical, philosophical black holes radiate. 
It's also thanks to the radiation emitted by the phenomenalistic black hole that we know how it was formed. In this case, the historians of philosophy play the role of astrophysicists in capturing and interpreting pieces of information. These black holes leak about what, what has become unthinkable because of their existence. In other words, thanks to the work of these astro-metaphysicists, we can obtain information about philosophical systems built before the phenomenalist, phenomenalistic black hole was formed and therefore likely to be used as examples. I could present to you the systems of Spinoza, Malbranche, on one of or those of Thales or Anaximander, if I was not so incompetent. But I have chosen to show you how and why Leibniz. has come to claim that the world is made up of monads. There are several reasons for this choice. I will only mention one. It will be for me a way of paying tribute to one of the greatest philosophers there ever was on the occasion of the third centenary of his death on the 14th November 17. As you know, it's in the monadology, written two years before his death, that Leibniz describes the most precisely and the most completely in what, according to him, the world consists. This short text is therefore the culmination of a process that took a, life, a lifetime to an encyclopedic mind of exceptional power theology, law, history, geology, epistemology, logic, mathematics, physics, and metaphysics, all fields to which he contributed significantly. It's therefore impossible to enter in the details of each step of this of his intellectual evolution, but fortunately it's not necessary to reconstruct the whole of his, this evolution in order to understand how and why Leibniz dare to take this step from physics to metaphysics. It's enough to remember that Leibniz is a Cartesian physicist. For him, the natural world is made of an extension, every part of which is in motion. But unlike Descartes, he conceives this extension is infinitely divisible, and he thinks that the law uh, to which all these motions obey is the law of conservation of the living force, and not the law of conservation of the quantity of motion. You notice that the living force is a scalar quantity. So all results from all results from collisions between parts of the extension, exchanging on these occasions quantities of living force in such a way that the living force of the system which they form remains constant. At least, <laughs> at least, at least it seems to be, because and this is the discovery made by Leibniz, or oh. <laughs> you, you, you have to put this. <laughs> I'm sorry. You understand? You, you will understand. Because, and this is the discovery made by Leibniz in the Specimen Dynamicum in 16, 95, this exchange of vis viva is not real, but only apparent. As he explained in this text by means of a correct diagram, 
During a collision, each body merely undergoes a variation of its living force, perfectly, perfectly tuned to that undergone by the other body. And the same goes for each part of each part of the bodies. And for each part of these parts, and so on infinitely. In such a way that there is never really a collision, but merely an infinity of tuned variations of living force. But this is obviously not without effect. The bodies are deformed, but this effect is only phenomenal. Therefore, what exists are neither the bodies nor the extension, but the living forces. Or more exactly, the primitive forces from which these living forces are derived, in the mathematical sense of the terms, for two reasons. Firstly, because what really exists must be substantial, that is, can only depend on oneself in order to exist. And secondly, because a substance is not only the sequence of all of its states, it's what acts and therefore also what generates this sequence through its own activity. So the world is made up of monads. Yeah. Just monads, analogous to the functions in the mathematical realm. Those true atoms of nature if the property is described in the monadology, the first stage of the monadology. They have no parts. They cannot begin except by creation or, and except by annihilation. Each of them is different from any other. Their changes are continuous and, and come from an internal principle. They don't interact. They have no window through which anything could enter or depart. More importantly, for our concern, all the rest of the world is derived from their harmonic activities which generate the living force, which generates the bodies and consequently the space and all the phenomena we can observe. Needless to say, I don't propose to adopt the Leibnizian metaphysics. I don't even suggest building a new monadology. I only wished to show that it's in principle possible to move from physics to metaphysics as we are now imposed upon by the facts. And there are many more, many other inspiring examples. As to how to make this jump, I have some ideas, but a bus is waiting. <laughs> we'll call, <laughs> talk about that on another occasion. Thank you.